Hello guys, welcome back to AI in Space Tech. In this second section of our episode, namely the knowledge section, I'm going to be presenting a very important breakthrough paper that was published some time ago, uh, actually in 2015, in the computer vision community, and it made a very big breakthrough in the field of convolutional networks for the task of semantic segmentation. Uh, as you can see, the paper is called Fully Convolutional Networks for Semantic Segmentation. The abbreviation of these uh, Fully Convolutional Networks is just FCN. Uh, the importance of this paper was that it proposed um, a new approach on how to tackle some inherited problems of the standard convolutional networks for the task of uh, semantic segmentation and therefore it was a very big success that uh, drove the community to many many advances. Um, the paper nowadays is quite outdated. Um, it was first published as I said in 2015 and this is uh, quite some time ago but nevertheless I believe that uh, it's important for us to study it and to understand it as it didn't just made important breakthroughs just for the computer vision community, but also for the remote sensing community. Uh, personally, myself, I have been using these models in remote sensing, uh, and they were very, very uh, good, the results I got uh, through the use of these models. And furthermore, I've seen many more people nowadays adapting to them uh, and using them. Of course, um, if you're looking at this video, it's important to know that nowadays there are much better models, but many of these models proposed out there are actually still based on the principles found here. So, let's get started. Um, ah, before I start, I just want to mention that the paper has nowadays around uh, 4,800 citation and this shows how important work this has been for the whole community. So, the main authors of this paper was Jonathan Long, Evan, Sel uh, uh, Evan Selhammer and Trevor Darrell. All of them were from UC Berkeley and what is important to mention here is that uh, Jonathan Long and Evan Selhammer have been two of the main uh, developers of the cafe library. Uh, cafe library nowadays it's uh, quite uh, outdated and I don't think there is much uh, uh, um, innovation there or I, uh, I don't even think they still continue to develop it but there is cafe 2 uh, which is supported by Facebook and developed by Facebook so um, yep. uh, what is important uh, about this is uh, after they wrote the paper they immediately made available the models and all the code for running it uh, to the community so people out there like me and many others use the models improve them and apply them to their data and that was a huge success um, so uh, in the description of this video I'm gonna be including the original link to the code if you want to check it out yourself but I'm gonna also include a uh, link for this same code uh, for the TensorFlow library which I think it's much more uh, beneficial as it's a very broadly used library. So let's get started. I'm gonna be using a presentation that I haven't uh, written it myself, but uh, it was actually written by a group uh, from University of Florence and I'm gonna be including the original link if you want to download it and check it out yourself. So let's get started. The presentation is called A Fuller Understanding of Fully Convolutional Neural Networks. And of course we can see the names of the authors in the bottom. So, of course, convolutional networks have been used for a plethora of different tasks. So semantic segmentation is just one. 
uh, another uh, very famous uh, use was for the creation of uh, monocular depth image and normals and so on and so forth colorization where you can see here an example uh, colorization of images optical flow which is a very active topic of research and even boundary detection and the most standard use of uh, or at least the first use of, convolu of convolutional neural networks were to perform uh, classification and in the classification we have an input image which goes through the large network we have and we get distribution over a set of predefined classes then we take the maximum uh, probability of this distribution and we find the respective class uh, that this image contains the whole system is end-to-end -end for training and this is denoted here with this arrow and we can see that uh, of course the inference is very very fast as it's sometimes smaller than one millisecond but a question is how can you uh, not perform just the task of classification but rather implement the task of semantic segmentation and uh, of course even before this paper people used to do semantic segmentation but uh, it was much more tricky and it was not very clear how you would go about it uh, if you read the paper there is a nice um, discussion of what the alternative methods were before the fully convolutional neural networks but I'm not gonna go there now but I'm just gonna focus on what these guys here proposed so we have here the standard classification uh, neural network and as we can see we have first the convolutional layers uh, so we start with the primary image you see here it's of size 227 by 227 and as we go deeper and deeper into the architecture we have uh, smaller uh, spatial dimension for the representations for the feature maps but uh, as you can see the depth of these uh, rectangle here is larger so this means we have more feature maps and you can see that we start with larger uh, representations and as we go deeper and deeper these shrink 13 by 13 here and then we have fully connected networks and just to show an example of a fully connected network um, is like the following so fully connected networks uh, you can see here we we have when each and every node is connected to all the nodes in the following layer like here like here all of these are fully connected networks so it's and every pixel is connected to each and every pixel on the next uh, level here uh, these fully connected networks are uh, very much generalized by straight lines but this is what the authors mean and here we have the classification network and the question is how do we go from having these convolutional networks to a network that only has convolutions so it doesn't contain any fully connected networks because this one actually break down the spatial information uh, that the network the feature maps contain uh, so up to here we have a spatial representation of the dimensions uh, but here we this, this breaks down and this is due to the fact that we're using fully connected networks that they connect each and every pixel or point of the feature map to each and every pixel uh, in the next layer so yes this is kind of a problem or at least was back then and what the author suggests is to convert these fully connected networks to one by one convolutions so here in these very deep layers which are also very wide uh, meaning we have a lot of uh, features uh, to uh, practically repurpose these uh, fully connected fully connected uh, network 
and to make uh, one by one convolutions out of them. In this way, we can reuse the pre-trained model uh, that we had for the classification task. So we can use um, the pre-trained model from ImageNet without any need to uh, train it from scratch or at least train from scratch these very deep layers. And that was one of their first innovations. Um, what I want to underline here is that these layers uh, here were very, very wide and namely uh, for the VGG16, which was one of the best models the author used. Uh, actually, they had 4,096 uh, individual uh, one by one convolutional neural networks. And if you think that you have 4,000 uh, individual convolutional uh, la uh, la layers, and now you have to convolve each and every one of them. Uh, with another 4096 uh, new convolutions, uh, you can imagine that the numbers go um, up to millions now. So this was quite expensive, but nevertheless allowed the system to uh, perform this transformation without losing any uh, pre-trained weights. Another important fact that we will see further on, but is underlined in the paper, is that full convolutional neural networks uh, were done in a way to um, use the whole spatial extent of the image. So there was no uh, resampling, there were no tiling, there were no need to extract patches and also to think about the best strategy to extract patches from an image. So they, they went uh, uh, directly with the fully extent of the image into the network and it performed uh, full segmentation. So it went from the full image down to a full uh, output, full size spatial output. So here is it, how it becomes fully convolutional. As I said, you have the image here, you have some feature maps, uh, more feature maps, more feature maps, more convolutions, more feature maps. And here you have the 4096 um, uh, convolutional neural uh, network layers um, that uh, at least were used for the VGG16. And here you have the output. Um, and what is shown here below is actually what uh, is the fraction of the initial spatial dimensions of the image. So you start with this image and in this layer you have a quarter of the initial um, uh, spatial dimensions due to the uh, pooling layers and maybe due to the striding that you can perform during convolution. Uh, therefore you, you only have a quarter of the initial resolution. You move on Further, you have an eighth of the resolution, then you have a sixteenth of the resolution, and eventually, after these very deep layers, you have uh, uh, one divided by thirty-two of the original uh, dimension uh, on 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 the height and on the width. Yes, and of course, let me see here. Exactly. Uh, so you can see what I mentioned. You have the convolution and the pooling and the nonlinearity. And as you go deep down here, you have now uh, from these uh, 32 factor, you have to go back to the initial resolution. And how do you do that? You just uh, by linearly as upsample. And so you do an upsampling and then you have the initial convolution and you do a uh, pixel-wise output loss. So you uh, penalizing the system for each pixel that was semantically segmented uh, with the wrong class. And you backpropagate that uh, so the system is trained. Um, so spectrum of deep features. To understand this, they have yet another example. 
you start with an image, the image has a pixel, and as you go deeper and deeper into the network, now you have um, um, a very global representation of actually what was contained in this initial area. And the, few, uh, the features <coughs> using the deep jet, and I don't know why they use this term, it's not very successful in my opinion, and it's not very much used either. And but this probably had some similarities with the Hari Haran paper et al., which was also uh, suggested uh, in the same year. So I don't know how much um, the authors had uh, uh, looked into the work of each other, but obviously this came first. But nevertheless, also Long et al. Uh, used this uh, method. And what the deep set did was actually they introduced key player connections. And I like this term much more than deep jet. So let's see what exactly are these key players. Uh, in the standard model, you have the image, you have the convolutions, the poolings, and you go deep and deep and deep into your architecture. And after the sixth and seventh layer, these very deep and wide uh, repurposed uh, uh, um, fully connected layers, you had the upsampling and the loss function. And what the authors proposed for improving was to, uh, after the convolution here, which was 32 times downsampled, if you remember, to do the following trick. So you upsample by a factor of two the convolutional layer number seven, which was the last one. And then this now matches with the output from the pooling layer number four. And what they did was th they upsample by a factor of two and they do um, pixel wise summation. And then they redo this uh, trick again. So they upsample what they get now from this process here by a factor of two, and now this convolutional uh, output matches the uh, output from uh, the pooling layer number three. And you do a pixel-wise summation, and then, of course, now you have to, um, again, upsample, but now you don't have to upsample uh, by a factor of 32, but by a factor of 8, and you get the dense output. And of course, this scheme is end to end joint learning of semantics and location. So, practically, what they do is that they refine the details of the output uh, segmentation by these uh, key player connections. And what they suggest is that for this network. Uh, it's only beneficial to do it twice, so to do two of these key player connections. But in future papers, people found out um, that if they do also earlier connections, the system uh, is much more benefited. So, um, okay, here the authors suggest that earlier connections didn't improve much, but uh, this is not very right. So now we know that if you introduce more and more connections from earlier layers, you get much more level of detail. And these skip layer connection, they call it deep jet in the paper for some reason that I don't understand. Um, so you have the following networks now with the skip layer refinement. You have the standard uh, no skip connection, uh, which needs an upsampling of uh, a factor of 32 to match the output the, the input resolution you have the network with only one skip layer connection uh, and this is called uh, now you just need to upsample by a factor of 16 and you have the one with two uh, skip layer connections that now you only have to upsample the output by a factor of 8 to match the input resolution. And what you can see is that uh, 
in this particular example, the level of detail increases as they introduce more and more skip level connections. Uh, so, as I said, these skip layer connections, they're very important for bringing back the fine-grained uh, detail. So, uh, you see here they have a very broad output. Uh, here is more refined, more refined, and of course when you compare it with the ground truth, the outcome is rather good. Um, okay, here they talk a little bit about the computation, but I don't want to go to these um, to these uh, aspect of the network. But I want actually to go to the results they had. So back then in 2015, this is some of the better models on the Pascal uh, VOC segmentation benchmark. And you can see that their model was actually doing much better uh, qualitatively. But let's see quali quantitatively how they perform. So they had state-of-the-art result in relation to the SDS. SDS, I guess, is this model. And they had a, a relative percent improvement for the IOU measurement. And what is very important is was uh, that their model was 286 times faster than this SCSDS model that was uh, simulation and detection cementation. Uh, this was the best previous model back then. And I mean, this it's a huge improvement in speed, 286 times. Ooh. And of course, they use the framework of CAFE, and here we have the, the computation, of course, these are all the results, okay, let's not go into this very detailed thing, but what I found very interesting is this slide, so um, what you can see here is the date of result submission of the original FCN, and here you have the uh, test uh, accuracy, let's say. Um, so you have the original model, and with blue dot uh, are the FC FCN-based methods, and with the green square you have other methods. And what we can see is that uh, after the original FCN proposal, many, many other people start doing improvements over the standard FCN model and significantly proving the results, uh, also in relation with people who didn't use the FCN based model. So uh, we, we see here how important it was actually for the community to improve uh, based on, 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 on the achievements of, of the, on the findings of the standard FCN model. Okay, care and feeding of fully convolutional networks. So as I said before, what was very important is that you train on the full image at the uh, time without sampling. So you completely um, reject the sampling part, which is a big uh, bottleneck for this kind of processes, as you have to think how you would sample, maybe you're oversampling, uh, maybe you're oversampling some particular class, and so on and so forth. So they say, okay, with full convolution networks, you can just go straight for the large image. You don't have to think about uh, sampling. So reshape the network to take input of any size. Of course, you can reshape your image, uh, standardize uh, them to a fixed uh, size input, and then use this network for any uh, image size. And of course, uh, what the authors say here is that um, for one image of about 500 by 500 pixels and 21 semantic classes, which was uh, what uh, was the requirement for the Pascal VOC challenge, they need about uh, 100 milliseconds. And this is uh, quite a uh, good time. Okay, here you have different variations of the model and what, how well it performs, but this is not so interesting. And also 
some information regarding the bat size and the momentum, but I, I really think these are small details in relation to the big breakthroughs that uh, was um, achieved by this system. So, what about the sampling of the images? And what the authors improved uh, quantitatively is that the no need for sampling, there is no improvement for sampling across images. So here you have the full image, the 50% sampling and the 25% sampling of the original spatial dimensions. And what you can see here, which is very interesting, here we have the loss and here we have the um, number of images practically processed by the system. And what you can see is that we, by using the full uh, image size, you have a much faster uh, um, convergence, so you actually see many more images um, in the in in a relatively shorter amount of time. Whereas when you use fifty percent sampling, well, where you practically converge to the same loss, but after some time, uh, probably the double time, more or less, and if you use twenty five percent sampling, you don't even converge. Uh, um, as, as this diagram shows here, maybe you converge in the future, but um, so you practically you get the same result, but but much faster. And this is of course very important when you are training for for hours or days or even weeks. Um, sampling of pixels, uh, there was uh, no improvement from partially decorrelated pixels, and okay. Also, they found out that uh, this was not important, but what about the context, which is quite interesting. So what they do find is that uh, FCNs incorporate contextual cues. And by, by experiments, they proved that the system loses about 3 to 4% uh, when the background is masked. So even the background is very useful for the system uh, to, to train, so it just doesn't need just the object. But what is important is that the system can actually learn from the background or the shape alone if it's forced to. So the standard model, uh, about 85 uh, units uh, here, and if you use the background alone, you get 38, and if you use the shape alone, you, you get 29. So um, this is uh, not bad considering the fact that you are just using the background or just the shape information and not uh, the standard image. So, of course, that w what this shows also is that the system requires all the information. So you need the background, you need the shape, you, you learn from all of these uh, different uh, image cues. So, a little bit about the past and the future of these systems. Of course, some of the first works of convolutional neural networks were by Lecan and Matan in 1992, by the work called Shape Dip Displacement Network. Uh, then other authors also looked into the convolutional locator network, like Wolf and Platt in 1994. Uh, these are quite old works now that I think they are useful to be studied just for educational purposes. Um, another interesting work uh, on 83 showed that uh, it's important to have uh, pyramid uh, information. So the scale pyramid is a classical multi-resolution representation fusing multi-resolution network layers is a learned nonlinear counterpart. So nowadays we know that generally the system benefits if you have these multi-resolution pyramid uh, scaling uh, input to the system. And of course then you had another work from Z, Cointric and Van Dorn in 87 uh, regarding the, the jets. So the local jets collects the partial derivative at a point for a rich local descriptor. 
the deep jet collects layer compositions for a rich learn description. Uh, I haven't worked uh, and I haven't read these these uh, publications myself, but I guess they somehow relate with uh, the foundings of this work. So some important extensions on the standard uh, FCN model was that further on it was used for detection and segmentation of, in of instances and not just semantic segmentation. Um, it was used for structured output and also for weak supervision. And let's go quickly through these uh, um, aspects. So here we have two important works that followed the FAR RCNN uh, from Yersik uh, in ICCV 2015, where actually he has um, model proposals that he uses for um, uh, for for actually proposing a region of interest, and here we have a faster uh, recursive CNN from Ren et al. in NIPS in 2015, which I guess was quite uh, of an extension of this work. And yes, there were an end-to-end -end detection by proposals uh, using FCN and region of interest classification. So, of course, you see that the model of, NC of FCN extended to different uh, things rather than semantic segmentation. A uh, very successful paper that uh, I remember when it came out was the fully convolutional nets with uh, structured output. So what the authors did is that they used the input image, then they have a deep convolutional neural network, and they had a very coarse uh, representation. Uh, they take this coarse score map practically, they keep it like that, so they kept the scores per layer. They do a bilinear interpolation to upsample the, the downsample representation back to the standard input resolution, and then they use the fully connected condition on the random field to refine this uh, quite uh, ugly output to a very nice uh, output. The problem with this, and here you can see the paper if you want to read, was that this fully connected part was different than the FCN. Therefore, the system had to actually um, stop here and therefore was not an end-to-end -end training. So you had two steps that you had to perform. Mm, another interesting work was this one, conditional random fields as recurring neural networks, where actually what they did was to incorporate the, the CRF, the conditional random field, uh, within a uh, recursive, uh, re sorry, recurring neural network, therefore to create a, um, a fully end-to-end -end trainable system. And you can see here how they improved upon the standard uh, uh, FCN. So the FCN, you have the accuracies here, then you have the FCN with the CRF, but disconnected, so as an independent system. And then when you train it jointly with this kind of architecture, you get even better. So you can see some of the important um, advancements that these uh, fully convolutional network uh, gave uh, to the community to improve upon. And of course, yet another very important uh, um, paper that it came out by UN Coltoon was the multi-scale context aggregation by dilated convolutions in the next year, 2016. So what they did here was they, they had the initial filter and they increased the size of the filter but keeping constant the um, number of parameters 
that have to be learned by the system. So in this way now they had a larger uh, resolution into their uh, filter, but with the same number of parameters. And let's see what the authors say here. They enlarge the effective receptive field. So receptive field is uh, practically the size of the convolutional field, uh, the convolutional filter uh, for same number of parameters, as I said. So they raise the resolution and now the convolution context of the model, uh, similar accuracy to CRF, but non-probabilistic. Yes, so you, you, you have um, a bigger context, but of course this is a, a deterministic method is not non-probabilistic, such as the CRFs that uh, we've seen before that uh, other authors were implementing. And let's see some results here. So you had the standard FCN, which was from the fully convolutional network paper that I just described. Then you had the deep lab. Uh, the deep lab, if you remember, was the one that you had the small representation that you upsample and then you use the fully conditional random field. Then you had the improvement by the CRF RNN into a single system by Zeng and of course you can see how all of them they improve upon the previous model so as you can see the FCN is kind of the baseline now uh, for how the models improve and you can see here they're, um, they're improving and improving uh, every time closer to the original ground truth label. So, of course, the fully convolutional neural networks, they were also uh, were part uh, of the weak supervision community, but maybe you can read this information yourself. Um, I don't want to make this video very long, and I have no idea about weak supervision. Uh, if you're interested, of course, let me know and I can look into it and we can discuss it but I wouldn't like to go into a topic that I don't really know and I haven't read about. So yeah, here are different networks uh, and propositions about weak supervision and how FCNs were even implemented uh, in this particular field. Again, weak supervision and let's come to the conclusion. So fully convolutional neural networks are fast end-to-end -end models for pixel-wise problems. So we saw that they're very good for instance segmentation, for semantic segmentation, and so on. All the code, of course, is uh, available in Cafe Library, and I'm going to be giving you the links in the description. As I said, and also I will include the TensorFlow model. And of course, uh, they were experiment on many different uh, benchmarks such as Pascal VOC, then YUD uh, version 2, the SIFT flow, the Pascal context, and so on and so forth. So, with this, um, I come now, I guess, to the end of my talk here about uh, fully convolutional neural networks. And I would like to, of course, tell you to give me your feedback, tell me if you're interested, tell me if you want to see more, uh, ask me questions, maybe I have missed something from the paper that you would be interested to talk about. Uh, I know this paper very well because I've been working on it uh, myself for quite some time uh, on a variation, of course, I, I was not part of the original team. Um, but if you have any questions, let me know, I'll try to give you uh, answers, if you have any comments to make, if you think that I missed something, let me know. And please give me your feedback, what would you like to see uh, in the next videos, what you will be uh, interested to analyze uh, in the knowledge section in uh, the next episode. Uh, maybe you're interested more in computer vision, um, papers, maybe you're interested more in something about remote sensing and machine learning, let me know. Uh, otherwise, I will have, again, 
unfortunately, to, to make the choice myself and not to consider your opinion. Uh, so, very important, give me your opinion, uh, like this video, subscribe to our channel, uh, dislike the video if you think it wasn't good, and with this, I come to the end. Thank you guys for checking out the video, and see you next time. Bye-bye.